Hello, and welcome to The Dive, presented by Honda. Season 5, episode 17. We just finished with the Rumble stage. And we're moving straight on to semifinals here. Although Cloud9 and Pentanet are both not moving on, they are done. Rest in peace. Yeah. That was a doozy of a group stage. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there. A lot of things happen. Uh, I'm actually looking forward to talking about it. <laughs> Great, yeah, super. <laughs> Me too. What do you? What do you I was like, is, is Dale going to say anything? I don't know. Love to talk about it. I mean, I mean, you could start. Feel free. You're like, yeah, looking forward to talking. Ah! About it. I'm not happy to talk about it. That sucked. <laughs> I'm sad. I'm super sad. Um, <laughs> it was a really, really weird, uh, weird tournament for C9. I think um, that's what a lot of people are talking about with them exiting. Is is how good were they really? Because they were able to take games off the Korea and Chinese number one seeds, but then they also lost to, no offense to Pentanet, probably one of the, the weakest round robin opponents to, to make it at MSI. So it's it's really hard to judge um you know how good they, they really were. Um yeah. And so I, I don't know. It was a really weird tournament. And then like the way that it all went out with the losing to Pentanet when it mattered most kind of thing, like all that was just uh the most quintessential anything that you could you could have happen. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it's tough, right? It's like, for, for me, I, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, and I kind of tweeted this, and I think people somewhat misunderstood what my point was, like, they took it more of, as an excuse. But it's like, I think that, you know, being being like, really consistent and not making mistakes is just as important as your skill in laning, your team fighting, your objective control, your vision. Like these are things, it's it's like an equal part of the game, right? You know, losing in lane, it's it's really, it's just as bad if you don't lose lane, but you're someone who consistently gets caught and dies and that costs your team more, right? And and the part that it's like, I think was missing as, as context from, from my tweet um, is the idea that it's like, not all mistakes are equal, right? There are some mistakes that are so much more costly. You know, missing some CS, not that big of a deal. Maybe a, a going for like a, a trade kill or a death or whatever, where you, you miss execute a little bit. Maybe not that big of a deal. But if you do that same thing, right, was when Baron spawns, you lose Baron off of it, that can cost you a whole game. If you bait your team into a team fight that, you know, they're not in position to take, that can cost you a whole game. And Cloud9 consistently made those kind of mistakes. Like the really big oh my God, the game's over kind of mistakes. And that to me was, was their biggest downfall. You know, these kind of mistakes are the ones that can eliminate 30 minutes of, of solid gameplay, right? And they had tons of games throughout the group stage where I would actually say all three losses against Dom1 were fairly competitive. And then they beat them once, right? But in those three games, they had critical errors where all of a sudden the game flips on its head. They also had some of these where it was early and it blew up. Obviously, most notably, uh, you know, the DFM one at the scuttle, the Mad Lions one at the scuttle. It's like these mistakes that just end the game. And Cloud9, I think, made, you know, probably more of those than any other team. Yes, they're obviously a lot better than Pentanet as far as their overall performance, you know, regardless of record. Um, but Pentanet was more like, okay, you're just like not as good as some of these other teams. They just can't compete for the most part. Uh, whereas Cloud9, to me, it was like, you're watching them, they can compete, they're showing that they can compete for 20 or 30 minutes, then they do some really horrible thing, and the game is over, right? And I think that's why people come away feeling a little bit weird, is that it's like, ah, oh, man, that's frustrating, like, we almost had it so many times, and, like, I saw a lot of, like, unlucky and stuff, and, like, I mean, I guess a little bit, but it was more about decision-making and poor evaluations, I think, of their position and how they had to play it out because a lot of it was unforced errors, right? The most egregious one as far as unforced error to me was the one against PSG where they had like an incredible scaling comp with Coglulu, right? And Blabber is in the side brush. You get them off the Baron and then he split from the rest of his team and just kind of like bear slaps the Leona. And it's like, what, what is this going to do here? And so of course, you know, PSG engages on him. They kill him off. Everyone from Cloud9 is like piling in to try to support him. They get grouped up. They all get hit by a Lee Sin kick. They all die. You lose Baron. Game over, right? And there was a lot of a lot of those. Uh, I felt like kind of plays. The thing that I wanted to tackle actually um, was the so many people throwing around unlucky uh, terminology. I know most of these people. Are not actually it's ironic. saying it's luck. Yeah, yeah. No, they're not saying it's luck based, right? And they're it, yeah. they're they're going for encompassing that feeling, 
um, and, and don't have a, a more perfect language to actually put it into. But there are a substantial amount of people that also see that and then and they actually you know do feel like oh it was unlucky you know and, and it's actually like you know luck based or chance based or so, anything like that which it is not to me um mm-hmm. if if you are making you know decisions in the game this game is based off of making decisions if you're making mistakes in these in decisions then that is your level that is part of you as a player or as a team and yeah. that means that you are worse <laughs> that is <Yep>. bad <laughs> you know bad decision boom okay that's part of me that that means that i'm bad it's like uh, a similar thing to your point on uh, on consistency because cons- consistency is not just important for the pro level of play it's important for just even you at home climbing your solo queue ladder um you know that 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 separates and it removes it's actually based on your rating is based on trying to remove you know the randomness factors um and actually trying to overcome some of the unlucky things of unlucky teammates and stuff like that so yeah i really wanted to tackle the the unlucky terminology because i um i I definitely think it's overused and i think we can definitely use better language because uh what really was sad was uh you know and what were some of these choices and these decisions um yes they also talked about specifically for Cloud9, you know, um, afterwards in interviews, they're talking about communication with Blabber between lanes and stuff for some of these uh, things. Mm-hmm. Yes, the Scuttle Crab one at the beginning was like the funniest because it's very obviously, you know, and clear on screen, a, a big blunder, and it's very easy for everyone to grasp onto. Um, but they themselves talking about it, you know, even before getting into game and, and champ select and stuff and the communication between top and being able to move and all of this it, getting bundled up into it. Um, for me, it's just like, yes, we, we could compete, um, in, in a lot of these areas, you know, like laning and, and, you know, dra- and team fighting in a lot of stages and drag fights. And we got to see cloud nine's peak, you know, in the win versus Dom one in the, in the win versus, uh, you know, RNG. So I'm, I'm still excited for this team, mm. but you have to remove, you have to remove these mistakes your example of the blabber going for the Leona is a, such a clear one because you look at that play um, and you see him moving back and forth in the brush too. I assume there is a lot of team communication going on right there and they're discussing like going for this engage, but you have to take into account the actual game state, you know, where he's so far away from his carries that if you touch that Leona, that is not only the worst possible you know champion on their team to engage on it was literally the only tanky champion but the leona is also closer to their carries so they can hit blabber over the wall cloud nine's carries can't hit and so then they're forced they they walk around in this group around the wall and then just get aoe leona stunned so it's actually the worst possible scenario their carries kind of group up in in an attempt to follow up on this play you don't even need to fight your cog lulu you could just afk and farm even even taking aside the the other extenuating circumstances of the game and where you're about to go for it, just looking at that play, um, you you do not that is not an engage that that is not a go call uh, as far as the you know the whatever whose choice it was communication um, or whoever starts it out that that has to those types of things have to be um, uh, corrected. You know, I think um, a lot of the blabber stuff reminds me of the early blabber in NA days. Um, you know, when he came onto the scene, there were a lot of jokes about him being like a brain off player and like just hella aggro and, you know, all those those funny like listen-ins that they had with Reaper and stuff is like, it's your brain on today, this kind of stuff. And then like he got better in NA to the point where like he was like, okay, he's just insane, but he's also really aggressive. Um, and like there's stuff like when you look back at this season where he like invaded, I think it was Xerxes and like he like just kind of killed him. I think he was on Lilia or maybe Xerxes was on Lilia and he just like sidestepped a bunch of stuff. Um, but it's like those kinds of plays that work in NA that I think the better competition, he struggles with making those same plays where he's just monstrously better. And like, it, I think he has to relearn a little bit on the pro stage, some of these aggressive tendencies where he's going to get punished way harder. Uh, needs to be a little bit more thoughtful about how he does it. I guess I could say I'm hopeful that that can happen for Blabber because we've seen him improve in NA. And like, as he gets more national stage time and games and stuff that he can hopefully keep keep leveling up. Um, but it's not a total excuse because he's been a pro now for, I don't know, was it four years? Um, and a starter for two. Unfortunately, they didn't get any international experience last year with, uh, obviously MSI getting canceled and stuff, but, um, 
yeah, you hope that they, that they can take this and bring it back. So if, if they qualify for Worlds again uh, this this time, that they can clean up these really bad and consistent problems that they have. And, what, and I go ahead, Azil. If you have, I was a, just gonna say, you know, one thing that that I uh, I did think was also interesting. I mean, people talked a lot about the Rumble pick, like that was like just a huge focus for for a lot of junglers, right? In that, like, hey, these guys just can't play it; they're not playing it correctly. I think that was true with um, with Blabber, but I also thought it was kind of interesting that. You know, there wasn't a ton of discussion about Morgana as well, because even just like stylistically, think about all the champions that Blabber ha- has been able to dominate on. It's like often champions that can set up for themselves, you know, playmaking champions. You think about, you know, the Olaf where he has all these highlights where he's just running over games. Lee Sin when that was meta for the jungle, you know, even like uh, his Gragas and his J4 where it's like flag and drag flash, body slam flash, you know, hitting these combos. It's a different play style. And I'm not going to say it's like the exact one to one or maybe quite as big as like when Marksman were swapping to mages. But I do think like the shift as far as the jungle meta was nearing, uh, you know, that sort of level of change as far as play style. Right. And we saw like double if was a big example who always got me in, but tons of, of 80s around the world struggled with that meta change. Right. Struggled with the shift from uh, traditional marksmen to mages in the bot lane. And I do think that, you know, Rumble, as far as actual like skill and mastery of the champion, we saw that was hard. But Morgana is also a playstyle thing where you're essentially like more of a support, right? Like you're playing a very different role. Um, you know, you have one unreliable skill shot in in your binding, uh, and then of course you can like be fairly powerful if you can land your soul shackles and skirmish and so on. But it, it's a different style than what he has been successful on. So I did think that hurt him too. Of course, it's not an excuse because, you know, to play at the top level, just as I criticized marksman players for not being able to play mages, if there's going to be a, a, a meta shift for junglers, well, you got to be able to play mages too, right? The more complete players always get an advantage, especially when there is a meta shift. Someone who can play it all is always going to have the edge. And that hurt perks here as well. Uh, perks, I thought, looked pretty, pretty invisible on control mages. He had one good victor game. Uh, his two Oriana games, I can't remember a single good shockwave between the two. And he had two other Victor games where, you know, it was pretty absent. You know, I, I'd be curious to dig into some of the actual like laning stats and maybe I can do that before we, while you guys are talking. Um, but you know, my feeling was he just didn't perform to his level. And, and those were the two guys that I thought, you know, just didn't, didn't look like themselves. They, they just had a really rough tournament. They played poorly. See, I think the uh, the blabber blabber thing uh, was kind of hammered a lot on both the on the Rumble and the Morgana. As far as everyone's like, he can only play Udyr. Ah, he's been figured <laughs> out. And then teams also started, uh, you know, drafting around that. And so I guess he won the, the best. stylistic play, right? People were yeah. focusing on, oh, he can't pilot a champion, and forgetting that it's like it's a total shift almost. That's all. That's all. Yeah. The bonus. But and, and you definitely notice like the bla- uh, a lot of opportunities where he black shields himself on Morgana instead of mm-hmm. you know Zven or uh, or Perks or something like that. Uh, yeah, th- th- those are definitely relevant. We want the best for Cloud Nine, um, and I'm actually very glad that this team be uh, you know did get this experience, um, and, and I'm pretty hopeful for. <laughs> you know, strap on my uh, already, my, my North American hopeful up. optimism, uh, because every time we get smashed down like this, you know, you you got to start sifting through the grains of sand for the uh, for the for the diamonds there. Um, all the things that they can improve on really were were shown up with a big magnifying glass here. Yes, there's been so much conversation around the jungle, around blabber, around that adaptation. Um, for the perks point, I think a lot of it was um, positioning uh, for him, both a couple in team fights, some in side lanes as well. But in some of my early reviews of the early games, as far as the champion specific stuff, like his movement on Victor in lane was really good. And I was getting super hyped. And I, I was just like very impressed in a lot of these situations where uh, Victor, especially in some of these aggressive matchups that he's playing it into, um, he's relying on movement to dodge on skill shots or ganks and stuff like that. He has really good uh, gravity field placement and stuff like that. And so I was, uh, I was getting pretty high for that. But um, it definitely, the he definitely had some positional errors uh, towards towards the mid stages and, and later stages with those champions, which um, 
to your point, you know, also positioned very differently than those aggressive ones where you're, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have CC or your Silas or flanking something like Lucian, that. Flanking Lucian, flanking Tristana. Like, yeah, or you're, uh, <laughs> or you're playing your AD carries. Um, and he uh, did play a significant amount of AD carries. But I don't want to focus so much just on that. Like Cloud9 had other, a lot of other issues as well. These team-oriented issues where we're talking about some of the choices for the setups for team fights. Also, if you notice, whenever Cloud9... Um, you know, did have a disadvantage at the beginning of the game. Holy moly, was it like blown open into, uh, you know, a lot of the games were just blown open to big gaping holes. Whereas a lot of the RNG games and Dom Juan games, um, you would see they go into cons conservation mode and they start giving up the minimum in a lot of these areas, but they do give up um, without confrontation and they look to trade here, trade there. Uh, and then you get scenarios like, oh, you know, Damon gave up all game long, basically, um, little, little incremental things versus uh, DFM. And then they wait for the one mistake, DFM over chase into the base, giant AOE team fight, boom. And Damon actually won that, you know, that DFM game where they, they were at disadvantage the entire time. So some of the things about playing the game from uh, disadvantage, um, you could see, you know, LPL, LCK representatives doing that, that a bit differently as well. Um, I really did think that the bottom lane deserved praise for Cloud9. I know a lot of people, especially with the highlight plays that Fudge is pulling off later with the Lee Sin um, and then in Aurelia in the final game, um, everybody you know focusing on that a lot. And I was very glad to see you know his growth, continued growth uh, as a player because Fudge is still very young and he's always had his yeah. sights on improving, at constant improvement, which is is really nice to see. Um, but overall, for the for the rest of the team too, you know. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think we could say that that's probably the biggest upside takeaway from this tournament is Fudge. Feels like an anime protagonist in a lot of ways, where he kind of gets beat down, but then, like, powers up very quickly. Uh, you know, like, at, going all the way back to the lock-in tournament, getting slammed by someday in Alfari to, like, qualifying for this event, you know, taking both them down on the way there. Uh, and then... Kind of struggling at the start, had a rough game versus uh, Khan in, in their first round robin of the group stage all the way to like now just hulking out, making plays uh, in, in the entire round or rumble stage. Uh, so I, I think Fudge is someone who can keep getting better. He can be a huge focal point for this team uh, going even into summer. Uh, you just can see that his carry play is, is something that they can probably rely on a little bit more. Um, and then, like you said, bot lane stuff was really good. Um, a little bit, like, you know, like everyone on C9, was, there were inconsistencies, but Vulcan and Sven, uh, I think, were a lot of times the backbone for the team when a lot of other things were, were going wrong around them. Uh, so I was really excited about that. I did want to hop in about the, the jungle meta point um, because I think it could be easy for people to think of this as an excuse for Blabber not playing well because one thing I do want to say is everyone had to deal with the jungle meta change. It wasn't like these guys were, like, the rest of the world was playing on this patch because everyone talked about, oh, well, NA is behind a patch. It's, it, it didn't it really matter. Didn't at matter. All. The, the, it did not matter at all. No one played these junglers before they got to Iceland, basically, or with the patch at solo queue, you know? And so I think, you know, you can talk about some junglers maybe being a little better in that play style already or whatever. But, like, you saw everyone, I think, in, in the group stage struggle with the rubble. You're watching Canyon have issues. Uh, I think Wei even had some issues, if I remember correctly. Like, a lot of junglers. El Yoya, even in the first part of the rumble stage, was like shooting his alt into the. Valley in top lane, you know that 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 nice image in top lane. If you look up, his alt was going down that thing sometimes. Like everyone was struggling struggling with the champion, and so that's why I think Blabber's mistakes stand out even more because he was making just non-champion related mistakes sometimes too. I think because yep. uh, you could you could see just a lot of people struggling, but like Blabber was extra extra struggling, and so that's why I don't want to you know paint it as as just a meta thing. Um, no, I, I wasn't trying to do that. Which is I, I knew I, you weren't, but I know people are gonna. Think yeah. that in the comments. So yeah. I want to make sure that we get that out. Well, there. and that, that's why I was saying, like, hey, it's an advantage. You should like players are rewarded for being good players good. At, at lots yeah. of different stuff, right? It's the same thing the top laners have to deal with. Guess what? Sometimes carry plays, carry tops are the meta, and some top laners can't play those, so they're pretty crap in those metas. Sometimes it's tank only meta, and some of the carry top laners aren't as good at team fighting, so they struggle. Right, it's a stat you're evaluated on is your <laughs> your ability to adapt, you know, and incorporate exactly. new changes. Yeah. <laughs> um, about uh, PSG though, they also got eliminated. Um, honestly, PSG did uh, not get eliminated. Or P PGG, <laughs> yeah. one letter off. PGG, uh, them getting eliminated. Um, 
Jazz won over my heart. Uh, you know, <laughs> ca- came in uh, already ready to you know root for for Pabu after you know All Stars and everything like that. Um, but Jazz as well, Bio Panther. Uh, you know, just just hats off to these guys just because remember to take a step back again, and and just for a moment, uh, you know, a round of applause for them as far as what they had to deal with here. Their entire league was dissolved, and their players, most of their players, shipped off. And yet they they have this miraculous run. They qualify to the group stage. They you know they get their upset win. Um, I I just thought it it was definitely a big celebration as far as the the monumental effort that they had to put in, mm-hmm. uh, and the entire time doing it so fun with uh with all the memes and and having a good attitude, uh you know keep, <laughs> keeping up their spirits. The memes were definitely yeah. an important part. I mean, yeah, they, they are were, they honestly. Were... Yeah, I think uh, they they use their time on stage well, uh, you know, um, both in terms of trying to have fun on the stage, but then afterwards, I saw a ton of their pictures at like the volcano and stuff. Like they they definitely uh, were having a good time. And I know I said earlier about like, oh, they're maybe one of the weaker teams we've seen at a at a rumble stage, this portion of the stage of the MSI. I didn't want that to sound like a shot because I think as Kobe highlighted, they had to go through so much crap to get here. That's totally outside their control and all this stuff. And so that's why it's, it's pretty insane that they overtook the TCL, um, you know, a region that generally is seen as stronger. And they were able to do that in, in this year where they had to go through a lot of struggles. Um, and then I think, you know, like obviously salty NA fan here, but like what they did was huge. Like they, and the way they did it too, was not like when they beat C9, it wasn't like this coin flip, you know, they got the Kiana and like a bunch of assassins and they, they three for us at level one and then snowball the game and counters run all over the map. They, they fought front to back with like a Victor control mage team comp, send a TK thing, got a small lead in the early game and then just slowly ground out C9. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. That's, that shows that they have a lot of skill that they can actually win that way. And so, um, yeah, I think Pentanet, uh, was actually really enjoyable to have, uh, you know, playing their games and then memeing the hell off Twitter. Yeah, I mean, I was casting that game and I was definitely dying inside, but at the same time, it was like <laughs> uh, I had to, I had to give them the respect for it, right? And I talked about that a lot in the cast that it's like, hey, like they're actually just playing a standard game. They're out macroing, they're out team fighting, their decision making is better. You know, Cloud Nine was not grouped when they need to be. At the end of the day, uh, they're not the better team, but they played better in that game and they played better uh, in that game with a tremendous amount of disadvantages that I think that their league and, and players have been been kind of dealing with. So I thought it was it was pretty awesome and definitely have been exciting. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the positives for, for me for Cloud9. I know you guys have been touching on it, but obviously I said some, some you know, my negative thoughts. Um, but I was just so blown away by Fudge. You know, not only did I think he had like a good performance for him or for expectations, I actually thought he was maybe the second best or, or even arguably... Uh, the best performing top laner in in the like Rumble stage, you know, I think probably number two. Uh, I think that is like a, a pretty reasonable take. I think that you know the playmaking that he had, uh, even like his his team fighting was so good. He was pretty consistent across almost all games. Like even when put down in focus, like the Malphite game, his team fighting was really good. Um, you know that stood out to me a lot. Obviously the Lee Sin, the Renekton games uh, have been pretty solid. Always finding good angles, good opportunities to engage the Aurelia game. Uh, whether or not you think it was like super serious doesn't matter he still played it very very well so you know i just think his growth has been so monumental and and i agree i think it was you kobe talking about their bottom lane their bottom lane was really good throughout the throughout the event right yes uh there were bad moments and stuff i think especially from sven he's going to be the on the receiving end of more criticism than vulcan i think everyone's like pretty agreed that like damn vulcan you played really well almost the entire time uh sven had some some stinker games and some mistakes but like overall like you know that that bot lane performance was good right and and i do maintain hope and like yes this is like me as a, as you know an lcs uh, hopeful and an lcs fan um that that they can make it happen for worlds right you know like three out of the the five pieces had really good performances this is one of the worst performances perks has ever had in his career and like i i don't expect it to be repeated in the same way at worlds like i think he can bring a better level and i'm hopeful that you know blabber can bring a better level whether through you know improving at these picks if these are going to remain in the meta over the course of you know the next 
four or five months, whatever it is, until Worlds, uh, or by maybe just having having the meta be something that fits him a little bit better and improving on some of the decision making, you know, reviewing some of the mistakes, learning from some of the things uh, that they failed at at MSI. So, you know, I'm, I'm still pretty, pretty excited and kind of cautiously optimistic about C9's chances going into into another international tournament, you know, knowing that at least at their best, uh, they can compete with some of the very best teams in the world. A uh, little note for the uh, continued meta. Rumble is already, to Freak's dismay, on the list for bans for jungle specifically uh, <laughs> for the next patch. They already announced it. They tweeted out their little preview for that. Uh, so I think they want to keep him out at least a little bit, uh, tone that power down. Perfect setup there, Azale, for our Honda MVP section. Uh, if we can move right along to the Honda MVP uh supported uh section that we have here question this time around what was the moment or play uh and the player responsible for that moment uh from the rumble stage games that really stood out to you i think uh for me uh it's gotta be the fudge aurelia i mean i know that the uh the game didn't matter most recently (laughs) it was as fresh on my mind that was really clean. Hit over the Wraith Camp wall. Hit a multi-man ultimate to get a bunch of stacks on people. And then use them to jump and kind of Congo line into the uh, uh, Zaya who was coming down out of her ultimate. Uh, got her to panic by going to the person next to her. That was really clean. I like Fudge's carry play. I hope we see more of it in the LCS now, this split. And less, less Gragas weak side. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, as they all set it up, talking uh, of giving a bunch of praise to Fudge, but we we could just go down the line and keep choosing Fudge plays. The Lee Sin Fudge play. That that was when I still had hope, you know? I That was early in the morning. Just woke up, listening to the games, looking at it on my phone. I'm like, holy shit, let's go Fudge, we can do it. And, you know, like, that. that's when you're like, oh my God, Cloud9, this win's going to be huge. We can make it out. And it was just so well thought out. To me, I always love the plays the most, um, you know, from guys like Faker. Is not not just like the Zed play, but you think of the Cassiopeia plays, uh, where he's he's predicting what his opponent's next move is going to be and dodging the CC preemptively. So Fudge goes in. He's like, "All right, Nautilus is going to try and Q auto me. Obviously, lock him down." But he's slow champion, so warp hop to the side to dodge it, then flash over to the carry. And that type of predictive play around your opponent's best options are always what I love to see the most because that that that's the mark of the highest level of players is they play around what their opponents are going to do and then it looks really cool. Yeah, for me, the fudge interview. Wow, what a man, you know, just handling those questions with such poise, such a calm So humble, just looking to improve all that confidence. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do you, do you have a, do you have another one? <laughs> yeah, yeah. for, for me, for the uh, fudge love fest. <laughs> uh, <laughs> another one would be uh, Maple. Just his Akali game, I think, versus Cloud Nine was absolutely insane. That one really stood out to me. Um, not only because you know Maple has just been kind of like a beast for so many years. He has a little bit of a soft spot in my heart because he's been so good for so long, and I really respect the consistency. Uh, but also because Akali wasn't really meta in this tournament, right? And he busted it out. I thought they had a much worse comp than Cloud9 in that game. And it just didn't matter because he just went beast mode. You know, he solo killed perks in lane. He was popping off in team fights. He was playing, I just thought, such an incredible game. And and that was uh, one of the moments that really stood out to me. The, the I think the one that, that really stood out to me too was the Xiaohu game. I think it was against Damwon, uh, where he was Lee Sin, and they had uh tf to support him and he was i think that was uh against someone but i, I can't remember either way i mean like Xiaohu was someone that people were a little concerned about coming into the tournament and uh you know after watching him regionally kind of get uh stomped on a little bit in the playoffs uh but he's been one of the best players for for rng i'd say and mm-hmm. really really good at making plays uh, his nar has been disgusting but that Lee Sin game was one where they kind of fell behind everywhere on the map but top lane uh, and he got really ahead. And then he actually was the key factor in like the turning fight and being able to go into like that Wraith brush and kind of wait for them to face check him and, and set his team up. I mean, I think Xiaohu is so good about the entire game of League of Legends, not just the laning phase, where oftentimes I think myself and, and a lot of people just tunnel on like, wow, did you see that 20 CS lead in lane? What a monster. You know, like I think Xiaohu brings so much to the, 
to the team. Yeah, I would also shout him out for uh, for playing mid lane as well because uh, he topped the stats <laughs> in two different categories. There, he was he was on the sheet for twice, one, game. one for one as a mid laner and one as a top laner for me. Um, but for for a non budge one, I would say Karzi and Kaiser. And specifically, mm -hmm. uh, the the one I remember the most is the Tristana jump in on three people, just uh, Goomba stomping, you know, blowing everybody up. But for so much of this tournament, and a lot of the plays were with Tristana combos and and, and all in bottom lanes. Um, but they they played that aggressive nice knife's edge in so many of the situations really well, especially early on. Um, and then Kaiser continued throughout the rest of. Uh, of the series to to be on point and starting out so many of these plays for them so mm -hmm. uh, that, that that to me was was really uh memorable the showmaker zoe game as well um yeah. that was really really insane like he he had a lot of i think absolutely incredible incredible games and i thought he was like by far the best mid in in the tournament uh so far he's he's just been slamming you know i, I don't think that um, any any of the other mid laners have really lived up to Showmaker thus far, and and we'll see if that changes in the knockout stage. But definitely been some some really exciting moments. Uh, so time to talk about the meta a little bit. Uh, are you guys expecting kind of any major changes? You know, going from Rumble stage to knockout. Is there anything that you think is is really going to kind of fall out of favor? We've obviously seen somewhat of a deprioritization of Rumble as teams kind of get used to like, all right, if he's going to get picked. We're going to invade him or we're going to do something to like actually put him behind. That's worked a couple of times and coming to best of five. Maybe that's even more of a concern. I mean, yeah, we kind of talked about uh, this on last episode, too, but I, I really want like and support the rumble picks with uh, CC setup in, in the team comp. Like you really get to see it shine. The PSG. I was just so. Yeah, I was so happy with the PSG comp, even though it was against cloud nine, you know, and, uh, you know, it, it came at them beating up the boys. I was just like, oh, my God, we get to see Rumble Kiana again, uh, giving me flashbacks of, of clutch worlds run and stuff. But um, when you can combine it with stuff like that, um, you know, things that can create space like the the Nocturne uh, Galio dive. Um, I thought I thought was really well utilized. I don't expect there to be big shifts coming forward. I'm hoping that we get to see um, some of some of these mid laners to to the point playing. Um, yes, Kiana's probably not going to be super frequent, especially not blind pick uh, like that so much. But Akali as well. I'm still holding out for for an increase in Akali play. We saw it a couple times. Uh, you know, just like we saw, uh, you know, Kiana a couple times poking her head in there. Uh, I hope for best of five scenarios when you do get in the weeds um, through the through the pick bands. Like when you're getting through these best of fives and the, the bands evolve to what just beat us, it starts to leave more openings for for counter picks like that and for teams to go for, um, you know, some assassin heavy style uh, pick bands. So that, that's what I'm hoping for, because I, I really like that that direction. Yeah, it's always interesting, too, how a meta develops over a tournament because it's not just about learning what's good for the patch necessarily, which always takes a little bit as you kind of be like, oh, this thing was actually good this whole time, or this this was something. But also, like, the individual teams learning each other's tendencies and knowing, like, okay, let's not give Kai Wing Leona. That's scary. And, like, those kinds of things that people start to pick up on. Um, you know, like, with Blabber, like, okay, Udyr is clearly his best thing. Let's start taking that away. You know, teams start to, to focus on that. And I think... That's what's also interesting with with some of this stuff. Um, you know, as as people have picked up Rumble, some teams have started being like, "Ah, oh, he wasn't that scary on it." So that that's the other thing that that I don't know if it technically counts as the meta in the sense that most people talk about it because it's it's more about the actual teams that are playing. Um, but I think that's also what's really exciting when you start looking forward to best of fives is like, "Hey, now you're just playing this person. You have a, about a week to prep for it." So like, what is your read um, from what you've seen? going on in the meta and then also from the specific team and group stage so far because mm -hmm. um, because some of those like i said like i would definitely <laughs> look at trying to get a couple of these people off specific champions uh you know Xiaohu on nars is, is terrifying and it's hard with some of the standard bands going on and then you start to see the really you know specific draft strategies and best of fives because if you're just red side banning these three things every game you know it's hard to fit some of these more specific bands in there mm -hmm. i mean both both the lck and the lpl teams like Nautilus Kaisa every single game if they can pretty much so it'll be <laughs> yeah. interesting to see if Kaisa starts getting banned or taken away or if teams just aren't really worried about it uh there seems to be pretty like mixed feelings on the pick but I mean Gala picked it eight times uh one I think all but one 
know, Ghost played 11 times uh, out of 15 games, and both their supports played eight Nautilus games. So, like, they're pretty much going to it every single time it's up. So there are, you know, to your point, some of those champions uh, where it's like people are really, really heavily prioritizing them that may be targeted and taken away, and uh, it'll be interesting to see if, if that kind of, like, opens up any holes in, in some of these teams' games. I hope that the Senna doesn't uh, get to fill in one of those holes because uh, they could go right back to to that. And honestly, I don't really enjoy watching that style anymore. The, uh, the Senna, Senna Tom Kenshi. Yeah, I'm down for like Senna Heimer or something. But okay, okay. If, Senna, if, if you want up with that, I, uh, you can get an approval. But yeah, I, I'm tired of this Senna Tom Kench stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of it's definitely it's definitely slow to watch, right? Like sometimes I would say the one kind of thing I, I like about it is it sometimes gets paired with cool split pushers and stuff because it works really well with like side lane play and cross map play. You know, with Senol and Tom Kench could mm-hmm. alt in and help you out. Um, but the like the pick itself is usually pretty boring for sure. Uh, Sen, Sen is just Sen is just slow, right? Like it's it's fun to play. I love it playing champion, but I don't really like watching it because uh, it doesn't really have pop off moments like almost ever. I know I'm sure someone's going to jump in the comments and link some highlights. Like, there are some, but... It's like cross-map cross snipes. Yeah. Every for, time Sen is hitting part, you with, with 800 range, she's bopping yeah, off, all right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, for <laughs> the gotcha. most part, it's just like, ooh, you auto queued someone from out of their range with a million stacks in competitive play, and now they have to back up, right? Like, <laughs> You see that heal through the whole team, dude? That was yeah. so good, that Q. I'm not, yeah, I mean, you could be sieging. great as the champion. There's clearly huge amounts of skill to it, but it's just not that exciting as far as spectator experience. Yeah, I mean, a large part of its playstyle, too, is, like, mm-hmm. you just want to make the bot lane not interactive while you farm up your stacks and stuff with TK, and you just, he gray helps, you heal, and, yeah, mm-hmm. it's, 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 a, it's a boring bot lane for sure. All right, on to some semifinal previews. Uh, Dom one picked Mad Lions. Uh, Shock said on the broadcast that they had a couple hours to pick, but they just snapped. We want Mad Lions, no hesitation. Grabbed them up. So that's going to be one of the matchups that leaves RNG with PSG. Uh, what are your thoughts just right off the bat on Dom one just immediately going to Mad Lions? Uh, I mean, it's, it's not too surprising given that you've already seen pretty much everything by that point in the day. It's not like you're, you, you have much debating to do if you've, if you've already thought about it. Mm-hmm. Um, plus you have like all the scrims and stuff that you probably have, you know, experience with as well. Um, I'm I'm not surprised they snap picked. I, I feel like that. I I feel like they, I rarely hear teams take a long time to pick. Yeah, but what about the actual uh, choice here? Because because to me that one, um, I, I thought it actually made sense as far as the the trajectory of PSG, um, and, and how they've looked just so much scarier each progressive day that we've gone on in the tournament. Um, I, I know a decent amount of people were, were shocked or sometimes you get offended if like they pick your team like what you think we're we're weaker huh you think you can take us um, I, I really do <laughs> think that the progression from from PSG is being respected here with this pick um, and again everyone's going to also always reference that oh my camera froze for a second um, they they are also incorporating a substitute player yet again and so mm-hmm. then it, it should be you like like you have more gains to get by working more and more with this player as far as communication and team synergy and stuff like that. Um, but also, I think uh, how they've actually adapted and utilized the meta. Um, you know, as as far as talking about our stat for for judging uh, junglers or any players on on adapting to these big changes and quickly incorporating the new champions. Guess what? River is all over that. Okay, River yeah. is he's all about it. Uh, he is fully in there as far as junglers, and that gives you a big advantage since, especially in best of fives, you are looking so critically at champion select um, and the evolution of pick bands over a best of five series. That sort of flexibility and adaptability is incredibly important. Um, not to say like Oyoya ha- hasn't been been right there with the with it as well. He's also because um, you know by virtue of them also moving on, you know he had to be, but he he was also quite good with uh, with a lot of the new ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think um, Mad Lions probably I think just struggled more with macro than than some of the other teams did. Uh, I felt like some of their games against uh, RNG and, and Damwon, like it was more about 
set up around dragons as a team for why they would would struggle less than like their skirmishing ability and, and some of these kinds of things. And I think that's probably why I would guess Dom one picked them um, more than so than they think they have like a massive mismatch anywhere because I mean may, maybe mid lane. I, I think humanoids had some some pretty questionable plays this tournament. Um, and and showmaker like you're saying is ill. I think you were saying that like he's probably the best man in the tournament. So like maybe that's one of the areas they're targeting. But I would I would expect that it's it's more of a team decision and just like hey we think that we can in a five game series beat them uh, because we feel really confident about our our play versus them uh, in five v fives. And I mean Mad Lions could pop off there. They're obviously a very scrappy team, um, but they have struggled to find that same level of aggressiveness against the top teams. And they they've even said that as much in their interviews that they feel like they have a lot harder time playing confidently, playing aggressively, and, and knowing what they want to do against against the the Domokia and RNG. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense, you know, especially when you, when you look at the kind of the matchups that they had. Uh, they were both 31-minute wins for Domwon. They were both like 10K gold leads or thereabout. Uh, they were both very, very comfortable games for Domwon. So I think, you know, probably based on the stage games too, it makes sense. I think where some of the surprise came, you know, I'd seen some surprise on social media, uh, was the idea of like, you know, the mad head-to-head -head with PSG being 3-1, you know, and, and kind of like looking at that as, as it being a superior team through that lens. And mad definitely had, had the better of PSG, you know, in their matchups. You can even look at the PSG game, the one that they lost, and it's like, well, that was kind of around the level level one or, or things that went, really went bad in the early game. Um, but it did feel like Domo was so incredibly comfortable against mad and mad, you know, had their had their good game today here where they got the, the upset against RNG. And I think that's kind of like big for maybe building a little bit of confidence and saying, hey, we can challenge some of these top teams. Yeah. Um, because I think otherwise, you know, if they got handled by RNG today and all the other games against RNG and, and Dom 1 were losses, then you, you really kind of have no hope, I think, going into best of five. So it'll, it'll be a pretty interesting matchup. You know, I, I think that um, as far as kind of like expectations versus reality for me, like one, one of the biggest differentials was the bot lane right i do think that karzi and kaiser looked a lot better uh i tend to agree with you that like their issues were more like team issues and, and map play and, and some of the things that they uh sometimes get caught out in you know like i know the eu casters are like always joking about like we'd be watching a game and you would be like 10k ahead they're like i'm like this game's over and they're like but they got humanoid he could get caught out like you know like <laughs> no matter what's happening I'm like you can't lose this game they're like oh humanoid you know so so some of the lec casters definitely do not have the utmost confidence in, in his consistency shall we say uh you know kind of a lot of memes about like uh you know how, how did how does humanoid die in a side lane like every single game type of thing um and and that's something that i think dom one is really good at punishing like if you do make a mistake dom one will punish you um and i think that mad it feels like their their early games have been pretty solid and and hopefully that they can craft some like intelligent plans and try to come up with you know some some advantages as far as their picks i think humanoid like his solution today was really really good overall i think he has been pretty impressive on, on those types of picks so uh i do think they're they're fairly flexible and and they're gonna have to look to i think craft like specific strategies to try to i think get a one up on dom one because dom one is just so solid like despite the fact that there was so much talk about oh my god they're so shaky they went eight and two in the rumble phase right and and they still win so many of these games you know they topped the group in the first stage top group in the second stage and yes they had closer games i think than people were expecting but Dom one does feel like they're getting better too. I think that their games were more shaky in in the first phase. You know, the near loss to DFM, the loss to Cloud Nine, etc. So, so they are getting better, and I, and I think they're going to be really, really terrifying in the semifinals. In humanoids defense too, and, and for a lot of Mad Lions, a lot at least uh, so far at this tournament, so many of these, uh, you know getting caught out over stakes or whatever have come after the fact that they've gotten this big lead and you can yeah. see it in his eyes and in the camera afterwards and his reactions and he's like here we go pew, 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 time to limit <laughs> test he's going in and all of a sudden you know in, in the games are like they have these big leads oh humanoid is under their sec you know tier three tower right now boom giving over a kill maybe they can use that gold uh and all of a sudden narrator is like spoiler no they did not come back and win that game mad lion yeah. still won it uh and you know it's funny because like we have this a decent amount with uh with european representatives you know they're kind of living living some some true to g2 style stuff where happy games uh, it's exactly some of these ones 
um, you kind of pick apart some of the choices, uh, some of the team team choices as well as individual choices. Um, but uh, yeah, I definitely do think the opening is there. I think uh, one of the key parts of the opening is Barrel. Um, he started to get a little bit more together in in the back half of the second round. Robin. Pretty sus at the beginning of this tournament but, for sure. But he he was like really the clear weak link through through the majority of this tournament for this team. Um, just questionable engages mm-hmm. in lane, out of lane, positioning in team fights. Uh, you know, just like kind of hooking in often, and then just like insta dying and. Like I always like Nautilus is definitely one of those champs who's way more paper than you think he is as a tank because uh, his only real defensive steroid is like I got a little bit extra health on my shield, which you know like isn't really anything. So uh, if his aftershocks down, he just dies. And I think a lot of times that that happens to support players, especially from behind. But like a lot of these were not that kind of situation. It was just like Barrel was was not playing well, and so like you're saying with Kaiser and Karzi uh, having a really good tournament so far, like maybe if you can. Snowball bot lane, um, that's that's a way in. But I, I still think it's hard because I think Ghost has been really good. Um, you know, he, he's had some moments where he, he ults a little too aggressively on the Kaisa, but he's he's not like he's not someone who got a ton of respect prior to this tournament. He's often considered like a, almost an afterthought a little bit for all the other good players. But I think if he was as good as as people kind of gave him credit for, this team would be struggling a lot more. He's actually better than than uh, expectations in a lot of ways. So. Um, you know, maybe we'll see if they take him off Kaisa, he just falls apart. But, but, um, at the very least you can set him behind too. If, if you're able to exploit barrel a little bit more in the, in the, the early portions of the game. Mm-hmm. And kind of the reason I brought it up, uh, during, during the Dom one game and, and, and then previously too, when we're talking about, uh, the 80 carries and like the Kaisa, fo- uh, focus for them. Um, the Kaisa has been for, for so long. The premier AD carry. Most AD carries champion statistics look very Kaisa skewed. Uh, and in playoffs in, in LCK, it was denied to him. Ghost didn't get Kaisa a single time. But he then, like I'm saying, if he fills it in with the Senna again, the Senna to me was also just in. It's almost like you get away the lesser of two evils, I guess that there wasn't too much difference in, in the two evils for me um, because uh, they were willing to run this then without Tom Kench uh, the entire time as well. So um, I, I do think, yes, uh, you know, the Kaisa focus is there for a lot of these AD carries, um, but it, it's not, uh, it's not going to be like this, this black hole or, or pit or yeah. anything that, that yeah. bogs them down. It's just I, tough, I do right? Lo- like looking for the holes for Dom Juan. I mean, they lost one game to a team not named RNG, and it was yeah. it was the one Cloud Nine game, and that was like the fudge Ooh. X factor on the Lee Sin, right? And when you're looking for these like crazy picks, or where are they going to do? If you look towards mid lane, it's like the only aggressive pick that Humanoid really played this entire year is Lucian. Got banned by Dom Juan both times against them. So like, what are you going to bring out? Like, maybe you do some sort of split push strat, try to like really focus on our, our mo- because he had. Uh, some pretty successful TF games, if I'm recalling correctly. So, like, maybe you could do something like that. But I do feel like if you're just going to play, like, the Victor, the Oriana, like, slow, scale it up, fight Dom Juan, that is a losing recipe uh, for Mad. Yeah, and it's it's interesting that, uh, you know, to match them up as far as the, the two teams overall, because Mad have, uh, especially during playoffs, like, had so much success in focusing on team fighting. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I'm super interested to see uh, the the adaptations from coaching staff in the best of five as it does evolve because y- you get that answer very quickly if both teams try and do uh, team fighting right uh, and you're like okay there are slight differences Khan likes Scion more than uh, you know Arma actually likes Wu Kong for for their <laughs> like team fight top yeah. side woo um, but but uh, like if both teams have similar goals uh, then you get the answer very quickly and it, and when we get into those situations where you're like all right now. Who's going to pull out, uh, you know, more poke heavy, or who's going to pull out the twisted fate and side lane play, um, and that that's the uh, the interesting part. I feel like. Yeah, I think uh, the top lane matchup is is probably one of the bigger X factors in the series because they do have that really different champion pool, like you're saying. Um, but I did like seeing Khan off the Scion. Thank God, I actually think he looked really good. Uh, in his his more aggressive games, like obviously the Aatrox game, he popped off really hard on. Um, but you know, even the Lee Sin, uh, they lost against C9 with the Jace. Uh, but 
I, I still thought it was uh, not not the worst performance. I'd rather see him playing aggressively. I would not play Jason to Armit because he's going to hit you with the the Wukong. So <laughs> you got to be ready. Probably ban that if you are going to do that. But but overall, I just like the the champion pool that Kant had in in a uh, MSI so far compared to his regional regional play. So where do you think that that Mad should try to look for for their like advantages then? Right. You know, if we're thinking, okay, like Showmaker is probably the best performing mid lane in tournament. Like Khan's pretty solid. You kind of like you're saying you like his champion pool a bit more. Canyon is Canyon. Like, you know, are you looking towards the bot lane then uh, to kind of try to be that X factor? Here's here's my strategy. Uh is actually, and it feels like everybody's like, oh man, you have this shield of invincibility around mid lane because you have Showmaker, you know, because you got best mid laner in the league. Yeah, okay. I say try and attack that. Take it away. Attack one of their biggest strengths. If you start to put pressure on him, it also, because Damwon likes to play so much for lanes helping Canyon get control of camps, if you attack the mid lane and you can try and weaken that mid lane duo with Canyon, uh, that's a way of also, you know, finding your way into the neutral objectives. Uh, and Humanoid is not scared. So Humanoid is not scared of anybody. So I, I'm definitely I'm definitely looking for at least them to test that strategy because El Yoya and Humanoid, I have a lot of confidence in as a mm -hmm. mid jungle duo. Um, they definitely have the champion pools to do it. Uh, they have the, the play style to do it. So uh, I actually... That that would be one of the first ones I would want to try and at least test uh, versus this team to see if you can you know find a... yeah I I think that's smart in the best of five because you have time to like kind of try and figure out what's going to work and if you do that get rid of his Zoe Showmaker Zoe is disgusting and it is one of the better like in into control mage matchups while still having priority and all this stuff I was the early game, I was spectating uh, humanoid in EUS solo queue yesterday he played like four Zoe games in a row. Uh, as well, so it could be like you don't have to ban it. Maybe it could be a takeaway type of yeah situation. Uh, but I, I like that, Mark. Yeah, it seems to make a lot of sense. We, we we beat we beat Dom Juan together, Kobe. <laughs> <laughs> it's solved. You cracked the case. Uh, I'll I'll be excited to see see how it turns out, right? And I think Matt is is going to be doing obviously a lot of planning. You know, trying trying to figure out you know what picks they want to go with. Do you want to play that standard style? Do you want to try to go crazy? El Yoya is definitely someone who could pop off given the right circumstances. Um, but it does feel like a pretty huge hill to climb. Uh, what are you guys feeling for for predictions? Uh, for for me, this is kind of looking still like as as much as I want to believe in in you know the, the rise up here from the Mad Lions and and see some sort of really competitive series. It feels to me like a three zero, like at best maybe a three um, one. You know because Dom one has been so solid, so consistent, and I just think that. They kind of match Mad Lions really well, where Mad Lions are are strongest. You know, you're talking about like, okay, if if Matt, if you think like mid jungle is this really powerful way to play, uh, it just feels like you're 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 kind of going up against that brick wall, right? You're going up against Canyon and Showmaker, who are you know some of the absolute best in in their role in the entire world and, and play so incredibly well together. I I go, go ahead, Mark. Let's go ahead. Oh, we always I said do it this, first. Kobe. I said go ahead Damn first. It. All right. Uh, I think it's, I, I go three one for them. That's the coward prediction. I'm a coward. Tail tucked between my legs as I say it. Uh, I, I agree with you. Like I think it's it's a tough matchup for Mad Lions. Not just um, you know, hey, it's it's maybe the best team at the tournament, um, but also yeah. uh, just directly. I, I feel like Canyon and Showmaker do such a good job controlling El Yoya, This huge uh, playmaker for the team uh, feels like he might be struggling a little bit with Canyon. It feels tough, but I would still expect Mad Lions to have one of these good games, kind of like the one that they had against RNG today, where they, uh, enough of these kind of shots that they're taking connect, and, and they can actually play the game out from there and win. Um, I know Damwon is not invulnerable. Uh, you know, we saw them lose to C9 in the group stage, mm -hmm. get beat by RNG twice, struggled with DFM. You know, like, you can, if you get ahead of them, actually make it pretty difficult for, for them. So... I think Mad Lions can, can probably win a game, maybe even two, but I would still take down one. Here's my reasoning for Mad Lions at least getting one game. I, I think that blue side is really important for this matchup. I think that you get very, very little value against Damwon in red side counterpicking them ever because they're so safe with their team comps. 
And and right now on, on the patch, blue side gets a lot of leeway of you know target bans um, and trying to force you uh, into uh, into your red side bans. So I, I think they at least they might not win all their blue side games. But I think at least Mad Lions wins uh, you know one of their blue side games. Um, so yeah, I I was leaning towards three one. Um, I think I'll stick with it. <laughs> Copycat <laughs> surprise. Uh. All right, makes a lot of sense. The next matchup we have is RNG versus PSG. I think people are, are, are maybe feeling a little bit more hopeful for a close series on this one, you know, given some of the improvements from PSG, given that they actually, you know, split games here uh, in the Rumble stage. RNG did look more vulnerable. You know, they obviously they lost one to Cloud9, they lost one to Mad, they lost one to PSG. Yes, they did beat Dom1, uh, but I think that is kind of giving people a little bit more hope for this. When you look at some of the individual matchups, it maybe doesn't feel like as doomed. I think Maple, for one, you know, really did outperform Cryin uh, throughout the group stage. Maybe that's a way in. And and they've had some some pretty you know different picks, some different looks uh, that that sometimes can help you uh, against the team that like on paper looks better. As you're talking, I want to change my uh, Dom one Mad to a three two uh, at least now because I also I also think Mad's gonna ha- uh, you know be able to. Um, you know, go toe to toe in some of these games that do get to the later team fights off of, uh, you know, Damon not getting a substantial early lead. But uh, let's move right right along. I'm with you. Uh, catch it up quick here. <laughs> uh, I, I'm also super excited for the for the next one. Uh, like we've been saying, PSG's trajectory uh, over the tournament has has been great, and that's what makes this one super exciting. And then ending with yes, that last game versus Cloud Nine did not affect their standings. You know. Third place, fourth place doesn't really matter at all because uh, the first place team is going to pick their opponent anyway. And so that didn't have a lot with it. But the fact that PSG even played the Wombo Combo, Kiana, Rumble, Nocturne, Galio, um, and and the coordination and the the choice of fights that they're going for, and even some of the earlier play in the river, um, really, really did get me excited for this team. Um, yes, I, I do also have the Maple nostalgia um, and the Flash Wolves uh, you know, nostalgia for him. And even Hanabi a little bit as he was on, on the later versions of, of Flash Wolves. Um, I'm definitely still going to be favoring RNG because they, they have looked so good uh, this tournament. I would still have them, even though Dom1 did get first place uh, with the overall record. Uh, what could RNG do? They lost the game to Cloud9. You know that's <laughs> unavoidable. Then, then they had to give it back to uh, to. They're like, you beat us, C9. How about we eliminate you yeah. by losing to Mad Lions? Yeah. That's, that was a, a five head galaxy loss right there. Yeah. Um. But uh. Yeah. Gala. Gala. Um. And Ming especially. I think Ming has just been insane this tournament. Um. His his roam still up to the top side of the map. It's just like Ming. Ming is a one man roaming death squad. Um, and he's he's turning he's turning around plays all over. His timings are, feel like they're slightly off what you would expect for support timings, um, to me. Um, or you know maybe maybe Xiaohu and AR is just really good at, at baiting in you know and setting up for it. But um, it, it feels like you, when you need him, boom the you know the the Batman light in the sky is on and, and Ming is there making the play for you. <laughs> Yeah, I think the, the bot lane for RNG has been really insane. Uh, the one time that RNG, uh, when they lost to PSG, it was a, a pretty crazy bot lane snowball in favor of PSG, where they, they got, I think it was a gank, they got a kill, and then when they reset on the map, there was like a weird jungle invade that Doggo showed up to and started Goomba stomping on everyone. Uh, and so that was like just a huge snowball. But I think if that doesn't happen, you know, like Ming, like you said, is so important for the team and, and getting everyone else ahead that... Uh, when he's not shut down, uh, he he will usually take over the games. I, I also kind of agree with your point about RNG maybe being the better between Dom Juan. It's a very interesting conversation. Um, but I think they tend to get more mechanically outplayed, I think, than, than Dom Juan does usually. Um, I think they have... Like, RNG is this weird team where I don't think they have that, like, other than Ming, really a superstar that you would say. But they're all, like, insanely good. And um, I was talking to some, some people, they describe them as, like, this, like, free-flowing team that feels like anyone who needs to step up in that game can kind of do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think 
that that's kind of the the identity that they have and and I I think they're actually so insane on a macro level about how they control games and stuff like that. Um I I really like how they play. I think it's it's way more balanced than some of the other teams. They for sure uh, and I think, yeah, people can contest you on who's better than or Dom one. I think they for sure, without beyond a shadow of a doubt, have proven that they are the best um, map wide team, side lane playing team. They have they have had way more impressive, you know, split push victories. Um, mm -hmm. To your third point on on objective trading Actually and macro TF decisions, and like... I, I think yeah, I think that's boom, uh, no contest right there. Re really impressive. Yeah, I mean, they're an interesting team, right? And they kind of buck the traditional LPL trend of being like the super crazy aggressive team, right? You know, even in the LPL, they were more the kind of like measured, they play side lanes, they're good at 5v5, they're like kind of the macro team, right? The, they win a lot of the games either through side lanes or 5v5. And traditionally, when you think to a lot of like the LPL teams that have been dominant, it's it's like superstar solo laners, you know, like gapping people as far as uh lane goes and and that's not usually what they do um you know shahu i think people are are pretty hot on him but like even when you look at playoffs right like him him getting last in lane by nuggery every single game yeah. and and then just winning the game anyway right like they're getting past a lot of these teams in the lpl that have those superstars that you're kind of more used to seeing you know the rookies and and the doom bees and the nuggeries and and these kind of guys um that i think people more relate with like the traditional lpl play style so they are a really interesting team but i think because like their team play is so solid but there's also more of an opportunity to sometimes like outplay or, or or dominate someone individually, which can lead you to maybe a snowball victory, right? To like have that kind of X factor. Um, and I think that's where, you know, teams can look to try to attack them. And I think that's sometimes where we saw, uh, you know, the PSG loss, the, the loss against C9 for, for uh, RNG, the loss against Mad Lions. There's kind of like sometimes individual outplays that end up costing them the games. Uh, because I feel like the, the parts are sometimes weaker than the whole. I think Ming is kind of like separate from that, though, to be fair, because I think he's maybe the best support in the world. Um, but but for the <laughs> most part, like there's more of a hope that you could maybe kind of like gap gap one of these guys in lane if you're really on or you really get a good pick. And and so that'll be interesting. I mean, PSG has actually had a really good early game. You know, I want to dig into it more because I'm not sure like how much of people's early game stats are affected by the Pentanet games. You know, that might swing things a lot. Um, but uh, in including the Pentanet games, RNG had actually, you know, like a 1K gold lead at, I believe it is 15. Uh, and PSG actually have double that. They have almost as good as Dom one, like an over over 2,000 gold lead at at uh, 15 there. So like their early game is pretty powerful. They could potentially snowball a game if you can get these lane advantages, if you can look for counter picks. And that's kind of where I'm more like, hey, like maybe you could find a way in. I still agree that RNG is favored. And if you can't get those those edges, which you're not going to be able to get every time. It's not like these are weak players. They're just not, you know, the LPL superstars that that you're kind of maybe used to seeing internationally. Um, but I do think that that at least gives me like more hope where it's like, hey, if you come in with like a really good game plan, when you come in with some really good counter picks, some cool level ones, these types of things, like maybe you could get a game a little bit out of control and take RNG out of their comfort zone. I want to specifically yep. reference uh, the game where PSG pick their solo laners of Akali and Lee Sin. Um, and, and, and they're just indexing so high on these assassins and outplay and flank. Uh, potential and they they play super aggressively in the early game to try and set that up and, and gain the uh, territory on map to be able to do that and I, I think that is another reason why uh, Dom Juan chose Mad instead of them. Go ahead, Mark. No, I was gonna say pretty much the same thing is that PSG's early game can can be pretty pretty dominant. It feels like a lot of it swings for me on Kai Wing and River. Uh, I think not that they're the best players, but like the same way that C9's best games were when. Blabber played well. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of how I feel a little bit for them, where River does have some of these amazing games on Morgana and uh, Rumble, where they, he just runs over the game, and Kai Wing is just blasting people with ultimates from Leona all over the map. And th those are clearly their best games. Um, and I'm a little bit more concerned when, when those two are, are the ones struggling um, much more so than uh, Doggo or, or, or Honor. Jungle uh, Diff uh, team, eh? <laughs> I mean... 
I feel like that's that would if you can somehow hold Ming down and and like High Wing actually is able to get on the map and, and work with River. Those are those are clearly when I think they're at their best, and they, they those two work really well together about snowballing their games to that point. Maple does have some outplays, but they're 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 less of that kind of individual outplay team and more about like a roaming death squad that shows up and murders you under your turrets and stuff at, at good timings. Kai, Kai Wing to me has been so insane. And that's why, uh, you know, people keep trying to give praise to supports uh, at this tournament. And and uh, and people usually are like, oh, you know, this is like the second best because they, they don't want to put it first because you're like, ah, well, you can't really put them over Ming. But then there's so many to me also names trying to get in the door for second best support because the supports are so stacked at this tournament. Uh, Kai Wing has just been insane, especially the last couple of days. Um the the games where uh it was the the Zaya Leona bottom lane for them um off of the you know their victory over mad off of yes they did invade the rumble they blast cone over you know you, you get this advantage in the jungle uh but then on top of that they mad mad did get the kill counter kill onto Karzi uh you know for the bottom lane and, and they set it up and he's got this extra gold and yet Kai Wing is still constantly engaging constantly finding these openings uh and, and creating this huge advantage uh for psg on the bottom side of the map so i, I feel really feel like he he has also been an absolute star for psg so i i completely agree with you there as far as like the the support ish play making roles for this team um really have been a lot of like how, how they how they live and die um and, and some of the variants for them yeah I also think, um, just like for RNG, they, because they, I don't think they have these superstars that we usually talk about with LPL and even some of like Showmaker and Canyon are nuts. Mm -hmm. Like they also have a little bit less of that just individual outplay potential in the mid mm -hmm. to late game uh, in team fights and stuff, which is why I think they, they have lost some more games than, than down one because they fell behind pretty far to in their three losses. Each of those were pretty heavy snowballs um, with like, you know, Blabber pulled off a gank top and a gank bottom vol or mid on volley bear just in the first like four minutes. You know, there's a level one where Cryon walks in, gets killed, and then like humanoids totally unlocked to run over the map uh, and, and snowball bot lane and stuff. And then as we're talking about already, the, the doggo jump and stuff from that loss, like I feel like they're, they're comeback, even though they have really good macro. Like if, if they come to contest you at the dragon from like three or four K down, they're less likely to just like, Hey, we're better than you as players and won this game now. Uh, the way that sometimes Don Juan seems to do that where you're like, wait a minute. I had the lead here. Damn it. Um, so that that is one of the reasons I also Give me that back. <laughs> that's why I'm a little bit more scared for, for, for them against uh, PSG, who we're, we just keep hyping up about how good their playmaking can be if, if they're on that day. I'm still not predicting them to win, though. All right. Who are you predicting to, <laughs> to win? Who, who? Let's get into the... Uh, I'm still going RNG. As Numbers. much as we just spent all that time uh -huh. hyping PSG and talking about the worries, like, ah, oh, they're just so fundamentally solid that mm -hmm. like in a five game series it's really hard to to not think that like they're going to be able to find find the wins and, and they have such a breadth of of different like play styles too when we're talking about like the global macro play that they can they can bust out with the tf or just play normal front to back team fight um as well as still being good enough to go like more skirmish oriented you know like they, they can kind of do it all um you know they'll bust out nocturne mid and like they have pocket picks and stuff like that so I think in a five-game series, I, I still expect them to win. Games. Am I going to say three-one twice? Am I that much? Yes, you are that lame. Next, as they'll go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Goodbye. I, I'm actually on, on three-one. I, I think it seems most likely. Um, simply, simply because I mean, I agree, right? Like we spend a lot of time talking about possibilities for PSG because it's it's obvious who They're the favorites dogs. are, yeah. right? You know, it's it's so obvious in both these series who the favorites are, and and I and I do think that PSG should be able to to get you know. A hold of one of these games and snowball it but like you say it's in a best of five it's really tough because they are such solid teams both rng and dom one are really really solid in playing out the game they play it out in in somewhat little bit of different ways but like um they are really really good macro teams they're really good late game teams they don't give you a tremendous amount of mistakes uh you know I, i'm so excited for the draft for this one because if if psg can really kind of 
you know, flip, flip the series on its head. I think it's going to be through draft. You know, like Maple has 11 different champions played already at, at MSI, which is pretty insane, right? Uh, they are not afraid to go for some of these really aggressive picks, some of these really aggressive comps. We saw them do it against Cloud9 today, you know, with the the Rumble, the Nocturne, like everything flying in. Uh, these types of picks, I think, are are really cool. And and that could be a way to, to beat RNG, right? And I think barring that, it's going to be really, really tough, right? It's, it's kind of the same thing where if you play RNG's game, if you play a little bit slower, you allow them to get out into the side lanes and, and start to really set up the map in the way that they want. Uh, they're, they're probably going to run you ragged, right? They're either going to be taking advantages when you're trying to go for dragons or you overcommit to a side and you lose an objective. Like they're just so good at that push and pull. And they've showed it a lot of times this tournament. Yeah, I mean, uh, Maple was the one I was going to hyper focus on because I'm actually going to say three two, um, and th- to me the the way you pry this one open is the Maple Cryin matchup. Um, mm-hmm. It has been very difficult for teams to to fully do that, especially because uh, Ming does roam up to mid lane quite frequently. Uh, just on some of these, uh, you know, push out. They, w- they will push out bottom uh, off of a away gank, even if they don't get a, you know, a kill, just a summer spell and a wave push and, and kind of transfer that pressure uh, towards mid lane. But Maple, man, uh, especially his, his Akali game, I was like, ooh, he's still got it. He may be old, but he's doing it. One for the boomers here. I want to see, <laughs> I want to see some big gaps. Uh, you know, anytime you, we've got one of the you know household names from years and years and years ago, and, and he's he's showing performances like this on the international stage, I'm all about it. Uh, so I'm hoping that with the versatility that they have shown, um, and in some of these games, you know, RNG are going to try and do their you know split push to victory uh, side lane stuff. Uh, I think PSG are, are are positioned to try and throw down on that, and then it's going to come down to can you get those individual outplays? You know, um, can, can they actually put up there? And so I'm I'm hoping for this five game series. I'm predicting it for the five game series. Uh, I still give the tip, uh, a final tip to RNG uh, for being the the better <laughs> the better team. Uh, but man, it, I, I'm super excited for that that matchup especially. All right, sweet. So we got Kobe's some predicting two best of fives. What a what a weekend is going on in Kobe's head. He's having a great time. Full game, full sets of League insiders. of Legends. Yeah, <laughs> Kobe's just trying to dodge some flame here. <laughs> Everyone's so good. Uh, it's such a great wholesome tournament. Everyone's great, and if there's one thing that you can be sure of, we're all gonna have a good time. <laughs> Actual reasons behind them, though. <laughs> Thank exactly. you very much. True. Three, try to, what, what, by the way, 3 1 is the most lame prediction. That, I said that three is zero for the most trying one. to most, dodge flame. Most, yeah, and, that, that one. I, I'm going for Mark here. So, no, uh, three, the, 3 2 is definitely the dodge flame if, if, if uh, I think it, if it's like a popular 3 team, 1 right? is the, the most probable statistically. Yeah. But I feel sure. like we actually, if you look at the number, like how series usually go, I don't think it's actually the most common. I have to double check that, but I, I have I no think, idea. Uh, uh, it's way, I'm not. just trolling. I, I, yeah, that's just talking out of your butt right now. <laughs> no, I remember I looked this up once um, a long time ago. Okay, it's uh, it's more. I'll, I'll take Mark's three word. Three I spawned more of a conversation. Mark than does anticipated have good Google here. reviews. I'll take his word on this one. That's true. Appeal to authority. I'm a five star podcaster. How could I be I, wrong? I'm taking your word for it. All right, we got some anchor questions here. First one comes from Isaac Chan. What do you got for us, Isaac? Hey guys, a current sentiment surrounding C9 is that they are far better than their record would reflect, either due to bad luck or simply better opponents. In your opinion, which team in international League of Legends history had the largest delta between their scoreline and their actual performance, in both the overperforming and underperforming direction? Hmm. I think back to May. It's definitely a tough question. Um, but I, I think immediately back to the worlds of H2K and Albus Knox Luna, was it? Mm. Um, I, I did feel like uh, that that victory um, and celebration on, on how far H2K got, I felt like was a maybe one of the over ones. This is um, an interesting question because it's not when they say delta it can go either direction. So you're taking the negative delta. They say they're says asking both. both. He says over. They, they yeah, I know, both. but yeah. You start negative. I, I mean, like, 
Kobe just it's lost also, all the goodwill he got from the EU fans for predicting the three-two. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's also interesting because, like, you, like what about world champion teams? What, like, you know, like they actually won, but it was like a closer final than it should have been. Like SKT versus Samsung in 2016, it was a full five-game series, but SKT hard stomped game one and game two. They were hard stomping game three before they kind of trolled it. Game four, they legitimately lost, and then they stomped game five again. I don't know if I think it was 2016 SKT, but that's one where it's like they actually won the world championship, but that final was way closer than it had any business being. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but they were still the, like worthy of getting to the finals, right? Well, they won. They still won. So I'm saying like I'm saying Samsung was worthy of getting to the finals. Oh yeah, right? so Samsung largest was the largest delta between their scoreline and their actual performance. I guess I guess scoreline. I'm saying it should have been a three zero final, but it was a three two. Yeah, so you're interpreting it as their scoreline being like their series scoreline, not their tournament scoreline. Well, I mean, the, the thing is then you're always saying it's going to be a team that got knocked out. I'm saying this world championship team was even better than the history books might remember with the 3-2. So they All right, under, no, nobody they cares about your guys' pedantic argument. There. SKT <laughs> underperformed by winning worlds. You heard it here. They first. underperformed while winning worlds. <laughs> uh, that's yes. that's that's a pretty hot take. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean it's a hard question, right? Like it's so hard to remember all the specific instances. I, I think you guys had some good ones. Uh, did Cloud Nine have like the biggest delta? I don't know. I mean they had a lot of close games. At the end of the day, um, you know, like. <laughs> in another world, would they have picked up a couple more wins? Yeah, probably. But like, let's be honest. Any, any is close a lot of the time, and it's usually those games, those trap games, and that's something that like you just can't afford to 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 have happen to you, right? Like, even going into to the rumble stage, I talked about this last week on the dive. I was like, yeah, Pentanet's probably not going to get more than one win, but if you're the team that loses them, you're probably going home. Surprise, surprise, right? Like <laughs> that that stuff happens. Um, I, I will say that their performances against the top teams were pretty good, though, right? Like, performance against Dom1 was pretty good. Could have won a couple more of those games for sure. So I, I do think that there was definitely a, a a significant delta between, like, three and seven record with no context and, like, how they showed against a lot of teams. But I, I don't know if I can say that it's, like, the biggest ever or anything like yeah. that. Do, do you have any uh, a, a example uh, references for historical teams that you, that you want to reference? Because we did talk about that general topic at the beginning of the podcast where we're like, about, okay, okay want to want to remove the unlucky phrasing and, and that stuff. Okay, so, so like, uh, a record that is much worse from groups than their inevitable performance. Um, so this is kind of like taking it, you know, one, like a interpretation of it yeah but g2 when they won msi only went five and five in group stage yeah. and they played against team liquid who went four and six in group stage those mm-hmm. were your finalists so like is that an overperformance based on group stage or you know an underperformance in group stage that like you know which was the real one that, so it's it's interesting to see because people are so quick to be like you didn't do that well in groups you're shit you wouldn't have done well anyway right like so good riddance go home but option but there, there was two teams that it was like this. This is the first year, uh, Medic tweeted out that Europe has ever gone better than fifty percent win rate at MSI, right? So Mad statistically from the group stage, if you just like a record, had the best performance ever. Does that mean that they're better than the five and five G two that won? Probably no one's going to make that argument, right? So it's just it's just interesting. Like I do think that records in group stage aren't always indicative uh, of the performance coming for the rest of the tournament. And and Team Liquid and G two that year. You know, a combined below 500 record were the two finalists. I was going to say option C is that the nine and one team who then lost in semis underperformed. IG sure. underperformed. Yeah, yeah that'd probably be totally. one of the biggest deltas because that team was actually nasty. Yeah, yeah, and, and <laughs> I mean, so that, it's just interesting, right? Liquid. It's like it's like which which side of the coin do you take, right? And and often in the biggest upsets, pretty much any time you have a big upset, it's some of column A and some of column B. So if you yeah. want to look towards this question more deep, you just look at all the biggest upsets in history. And generally on that day, one team performed better than expected. The other team performed worse than expected. And that crossover happened, right? Where the worst team became the better team in that moment. Yeah. I, I had I had two more examples ready to go. Uh, one of the most famous, the Alliance Super Team Kaboom. crafted around Froggen that got kaboomed. That's a that's definitely an easy one there. Uh, the other one to me that actually uh, it actually hurt my heart more because 2018 was such a special year for Worlds um, for for both North America and Europe. But the Vitality team that was mm. in 
the Cloud9 group and we got out over them, over Gen G. Um, that an one, I... Performance or an overperformance? Uh, I, I feel like it is... It's one of the ones where they are better than their record, mm. right? That that that's what I'm saying because they didn't even get to get out of that group, but they were right there on the, like the same. I always remember y Yamato's speech of the like, "Screw this old style League of Legends. We're not copying them. Take take that shit bull by the horns and just ride it." Like it was the same mentality. They took the same approach to like you know their their draft strategies. Mm -hmm. uh, they were all about the aggression. All about you know this. This big like revolution year in, in League of Legends that was this that watershed was moment. Year. It it literally made all of LCK like have this self reflection year, and they're like, oh, "Is it us? We got to change." We, and they have this like <laughs> you know complete identity crisis because of yeah. not just Cloud Nine, and we always remember Cloud Nine because you know they move on, and we were so happy, and we got semifinals even then after that. But also Vitality was a big part of that. They were in the same group, and they were of the same kind of creed i would say cool question thank you very much isaac great name by the way all right uh this next <laughs> one comes from i'm probably gonna say it wrong i'm sorry man ahad rajput how's it going mark kobe is Dale. my name is ahad and i had a question oh, about making a career in first name right that's a dub the past you guys have gone over the path to being pro and even recently went over the esports certificate controversy I would love to end up in an analyst role one day, but I have no idea how to go about it or what the credentials would be. P.S. I'm a recent electrical engineer grad. Shout out to Kobe. And uh, Diamond Top Mate. Where do I send in my resume? Uh, that, that's that's a, another good question. I actually get questions like this a lot. Everyone's looking you know, how, how to get involved. Uh, to me, I always remember the story of Zix. And Zix is a guy who's now yeah. coached TSM, CLG, 100 Thieves, all these huge names in North American League of Legends. And guess how he started out? On Reddit, submitting ideas to Hotshot GG. <laughs> and he gets picked up as CLG analyst just, just by like consistently putting in effort and making this content and putting it up to uh, you know, visibility for for the for the people that are in charge of these teams. More recently, I've seen a lot of people. Uh, you know, content creators, um, any anyone interested in like social media, doing the same with hundred thieves, and then and and tweeting out these things, and and them kind of going viral. It's those types of things that really um, that's always going to be a viable path. It's not the only path in, but that's always one that you can try and catch people's eye by by making something first, and then being like, look at this is what I made instead of um you know trying to trying to uh you know get in through oh x credentials are weird because it's it, it's not easy to be able to say like yeah, yeah i went to like esports college or whatever that's you know it doesn't exist right um but i would say uh even though you don't probably won't use a, an engineering degree at all it at least you could point to it and, and say hey look i am sm smart uh, <laughs> so yeah. it gives, gives you that little bit of credibility yeah i mean my, my story is pretty similar to zix and a lot of the early analysts i mean most of us didn't have connections in esports um we were just people who really liked watching and like zix i was a big fan of clg eu at the time made a bunch of like scattering reports for them to and i i tried to contact them on reddit yellow pete was the only guy who responded sent like one message but then didn't uh. follow up uh but then when curse at the time was they did like we're doing open tryouts between season two and or season three and season four I was like, I sent Steve an email. I, I had like sat in the email for like weeks. I was too scared to send it. And I just got, I got drunk one night and I sent it finally. And it had like a couple typos in it. <laughs> that was the um, origin of just sending it. The, here's it the was advice. Mark. There you get go. Drunk. Just get Liquid drunk courage and... right there. You know? Yeah. Uh, so I, I sent him the email. I, I attached those scouting documents and a couple other things. And like, you know, wrote up a nice cover letter, uh, basically. And I bas it was like, you know, just a cold application. Um, and it got in touch. Almost fell through. I had to like follow up a couple times because people are busy. Um, finally like just kind of just like kind of fuck it and that was i started working with them mm -hmm. as in a uh volunteer capacity um and then i eventually i started hiring people myself i mean i moved moved pretty far up that ladder uh mm -hmm. you can do resumes like coaching positions are posted on team social media on websites on different things if you're not doing it right now make a twitter account and follow literally every team that you want to potentially apply for um and start 
like Kobe's saying, build it and have something to show, you need to do that realistically. Uh, even if you're not posting it as content yourself, like I didn't make these scattering reports for content, but you need to have a portfolio for people who are making these hiring decisions to dig into and actually see what you're talking about because it's not going to come through on a resume or CV. Like it's real just quick, not going to happen. Real quick too, the the, the rank is is important and always yeah. uh, always help to, helps to include because it, you, yeah. you just get you know some sort of uh, you know, credibility there. I, yeah, the higher you can go, the better. But um, mm. otherwise, <laughs> yeah. like Kobe's saying, like a number of people started as content creators. Dylan Falco got hired by TSM by making videos talking about TSM, and they hired him. Uh, you know, I think Parth might have been a similar thing initially. I forget exactly mm. for him, but a lot of people started making content and then they got hired I, i'd also say i feel like a lot of times people hyper focus on like the absolute most popular team that's probably getting 100 times the applications of a less popular team right like you know you just need somewhere to get your foot in and prove yourself and work your way up right like yeah. if you're trying to uh start out with you know cloud nine or tsm lcs team like the chances of getting in or even getting your application paid attention to is probably you know enormously less than if you're starting for like the least popular academy team as your goal right like that sort of thing so sometimes um you know where you're setting your sites can help and i guess we're just kind of assuming that he means like actual analyst and not like someone on the desk analyst like for shows but if he if you oh. mean that then i would say uh i'll, I'll keep it really brief because you know we've gone long on this um, but if you, if you do mean like being on LCS analyst desk as an analyst, like that type of thing, you need to start doing on camera work and build again, build a portfolio in the same way. There are so many people who message me and are like, how do you be a caster? How do you get on the analyst desk and stuff? And you know, how do you get good at that? At the end of the day, you just got to start doing it. It doesn't really matter what you're doing it for getting comfortable, uh, you know, and confident being able to. You know, talk about pretty much anything and being able to be conversational and look at on camera as far as like having having some confidence and and being able to like be personable and have energy and and you know work on your tone and like all all these types of things there's all kinds of stuff and you could read uh you know all about any of that stuff um for any from any tr like traditional broadcast type sense as well because uh, all those baseline skills i think really do help get people noticed like even if someone's really smart at the game but you really struggle uh, on camera with nerves or whatever then it's it's tough it's tough to get in so definitely the more experience you can build up the better yeah i would say if, if it's uh like you're saying uh you know an on-air role too coming to the interviews and stuff and having examples of commentators that you look up to or in styles that you like so that you can specifically talk about where you want to be and what you want to become uh, and like your direction and your goals and the baseline that that helps a lot for people because sometimes a lot of times people come in blindly and they're like i love esports i want to be a commentator um, but if you actually narrow it down like that and you're like i love this person for this reason these are the types of things that i want to do well good advice all right thank you very much for the questions ahad that'll wrap uh wrap it up for us now oh my god Thank you, Honda, for making That's this episode I love possible. Azale. And remember, <laughs> if you're watching us on YouTube, remember, guys, on camera, you got to practice. Practice. Remember, you got to look good. You got to look, look gotta good. Be shiny. You got to be able to use your words. <laughs> you got to buff up the head in the morning, make it look nice. Hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode of The Dive. <laughs> You can also check us out on Spotify, Mark, what is happening with your face, Apple Podcasts, and Anchor.fm. Please send us your questions on Twitter. Use the hashtag TheDiveLOL or send us your voice messages on Anchor.fm page. We have an exciting weekend of games ahead of us. Semifinals kick off with PSG Talon versus Royal Never Give Up at 6 a.m. Pacific on Friday. Dom Juan versus Mad Lions on Saturday. And then the finals are going to be on Sunday. We will record right after the finals, and it will be coming out Monday, May 24th for the final MSI wrap-up episode. We'll see you all then. Goodbye.